just a minute i just let me know when i have to go proper and nice <laughs> so hi ishita uh um, hi pastor so could you give a brief background of your undergrad journey uh, so i did my undergrad from delhi university um in physics in a three year program so what was the research experience and research journey that led you to uh, applying for whatever you applied for for grad school yeah so um, i applied to nius which is the same program you applied for mm-hmm. and i so got just in. elaborate that's uh, so that's and, like and the national initiative so, for undergrad so i applied for the national initiative for undergraduate science in my first year which okay. is a program run by uh, tifr for first year students and then they take them to a two year journey in research with top professors from all over india and i got in <laughs> and then we went to mumbai and then we had a second round and then you qualify that round and then you get assigned to a professor that was assigned to alakre uh, initially who was working okay. on galaxy supernova stuff okay sorry was he working in supernova stuff yeah supernova and galaxies etc so he was oh he's so the was, neutrino guy right Yeah, he's the new dreamer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, my interests initially were in computational physics. So, I was a physics undergrad, right? And I also knew how to code. <laughs> I wanted to do something with computers and coding. I don't. I wasn't ever into a very, very strong theoretical. Mm-hmm. I also wanted something applied to my life. And then Alok Ray got a third student who wanted to work with him also from an IUS. So now he, but he could only take two. So you told me there's this guy who is Yashwan Gupta and he is in Pune and he he is okay with one more student. Do you want to go to Pune? I was like, all right. I mean, what? Where can this go, right? Yeah. And I ended up in NCR, and that's and that's yeah, that's when it all started. And I went to Yashwan Gupta. He was working on many things. Yashwan Gupta is currently the director of the National Center for Radio Astrophysics in Pune. He's a very well respected professor and a very very good advisor. Um, and then. we met and i told him i am into computational physics so he, he was working on transient pipeline at that time which is basically you have these radio bursts in the universe which are transient objects they only happen once non periodically and he works at the giant meter wave radio telescope facility so the point is to use the giant meter wave radio facility telescopes to in real time keep on logging data that they are getting from the universe and find out these radio transient objects and let the researchers know something happened so he wanted to develop this thing and you have so much data that you have to do it in real time so you have the mm-hmm. data you process it and it works as a pipeline mm-hmm. now this entire work was on the gpu <laughs> yeah and that's actually how i got introduced the gpu for the first time in my life okay. i never used the gpu before mm-hmm. and i'm thrown into the deep end of the pool understand the gpu i had to learn to code in cuda which is the gpu programming language for nvidia gpu specifically mm-hmm. and it had computers it had physics it had a bit of math and it had a little bit of coding so i was all right with it and it was a two year long internship yeah. i would come there every winter every summer and then every winter and that's when it ended mm-hmm. so Uh, I realized I like the CS part of it more than the physics part of it. Okay. I was more into the GPU than the uh, co- than the transient object in the universe. Okay. And that's when I realized I was really into systems and architecture, which is very sad mm-hmm. because I never really knew systems and architecture before I went into that internship. Okay. I never knew how big this field was. I found it irrelevant. This field. You didn't I have any to... course background, but the no, exposure had... was through the research. Yes. I had no course background. I had nothing. I just went for an internship. Found a prof who was willing to bet on me, told me to do something new, and I found out something that I loved till date. <laughs> and I'm doing my PhD in now. So yeah, I would strongly recommend everybody, like if you think you love something today and are motivated for it, that's great. But always explore more because there's like what you know, you know. Mm-hmm. what you know you don't know and what you don't know you don't know okay. and maybe your research interest is in the what you don't know you don't know like me and big day you are like you know everything all day mm-hmm. always so, try to explore so then you decided that you wanted to apply for a phd in similar field yes so i'm i fell in love with gpus basically mm-hmm. and um, i knew that i wanted to work on the gpu for okay. and at least work in architecture so i work mm-hmm. on systems and i'm into more of the processor designing part mm-hmm. like a very solid architect side i'm not mm-hmm. into compilers as much so 
systems is basically the computer that you run everything on so mm-hmm. whenever like and you have a new macbook coming out and the processor that is designed by the architect people mm-hmm. like okay um, so that's what i work on when you have a new os that's also designed by architects people like me mm-hmm. so that's what we work on we don't work on screen resolutions we don't work on how good your camera is now but we work on how much faster your macbook gets how much more efficient it gets it heats up less its battery power is more all of that is done by people like me okay thanks so uh, did uh, did you have to like uh, did you have any confusion regarding applying for the job market versus uh, no i wasn't physics <laughs> so i knew i did not have any job job <laughs> prospects i have to do a masters or a phd in my life yeah okay. i i'm i wasn't an engineer so that question is irrelevant to me okay uh, so once you decided that you wanted to apply for a phd or like uh, I, or a masters did you have any confusion between like applying for a masters program versus a phd program? i did that's something that i did struggle with quite a bit um so whether i want a masters or a phd but i realized that i wanted to learn about the gpu so a masters program is generally like two years long in mm-hmm. princeton it's 1.5 years long where the 0.5 goes into an internship and one year is of this like top level course work mm-hmm. but that's not something i was looking for i wanted to genuinely go in and understand how things work and to work on them Mm-hmm. because any systems engineer work that sort mostly mm-hmm. has a phd because you require or you can obviously enter the industry and learn over there but the academic environment i personally believe gives you more flexibility on what you want to do because my interests aren't aligned to any company's interests mm-hmm. and i found an advisor also who does not want me to work on what he gets his funding for okay so he gives me a lot of flexibility and i choose my own research interests i found a problem that i was genuinely passionate about and i get mm-hmm. to solve it okay so yeah yeah so uh based on like what you wanted to work on you decided that phd was more suited to your yeah absolutely okay. uh so once you decided that how did you go about the whole process like uh what was the timeline like like where you prepared for say gre yeah. or your statement of purpose versus asking for recommendations and stuff so i started the whole process in my second year itself because mm-hmm. it's a it's a very long process you first have to look at the kind of college that you want to go into i'm mm-hmm. from a three year program mm-hmm. so my college list shortened significantly because very few colleges accept three year degrees mm-hmm. yeah i think that's a very common question that i was getting that uh, what's what are the like the scopes are of- applying after a three year bsc program there are many colleges that princeton does okay and there are other ivy leagues yale also does as a matter of fact harvard accepts a few of them mm-hmm. uh, so these are the ones that i think ucsd also does okay berkeley doesn't but ucsd so if you want to find there are actually many top tier institutes which will accept three year phd okay. bachelor's degree sorry they accept three year yeah. bachelor degrees so that's all right and then i started my looking process as a phd applicant you obviously have to it's not the uni- so there are two things here the university is important and the professor is important mm-hmm. uh, if you find a great prof in like a university which is not that great um unless you're very passionate about the whole professor and you find like a a prof in a tier 1 always try to go for the tier 1 because it's the university name stays for a very long time with you yeah it's something i've seen mm-hmm. you know where you're from in your highest degree that you attain whether it's your masters or your phd the university name sticks with you and gives you a foot in the company you want to work in again mm-hmm. or like if you have a dream company you will always find an alumni working there Mm-hmm. the bigger the university the more likely yeah. it is to find an alumni so my so i started with like only top tier i had i had no backup colleges okay because i knew i wouldn't go there like i i wouldn't willingly go into a college which i do not feel very happy about mm-hmm. so it only had top tier colleges okay. and top tier professors that's so interesting I, yeah so something i've seen very frequently in people is that they already undermine themselves Mm-hmm. So they're like i will never get into this place yeah and so they never apply also mm-hmm. you never know you can't yeah. speak for yourself about how good you are mm-hmm. but then in that case like do you have some backup options 
I never I I had my backup option was an internship. Okay. So you would apply again like after Yes. probably strengthening your profile. Yeah. If you fall down ask a professor why did I not get in? Mm-hmm. Most often than not they will let you know what happened. And then of course there's always luck involved. There might be next time you will they will get a genius and mm-hmm. they won't take you in. Yeah. Because there are limited seats but mm-hmm. if you strengthen your profile you probably will get in next year. Mm-hmm. Right so at least for me I didn't want a backup university. Okay. <laughs> I didn't have, I was advised against it but I mean it's up to you right? Yeah. So for you the backup was that instead of going to a uh so called safer school you would prefer like strengthen your profile and apply yeah, again absolutely mm-hmm. okay uh yeah so uh what about the timelines for the other preparation steps yeah so um, once you're done with your universities i was done by i think the winter of my second year so mm-hmm. by the time my third semester got over i knew the universities i wanted and now came the uh, profile part so i started working on my sop first mm-hmm. and Yeah so I spent my fourth semester the my final semester of my second year uh, trying to figure out my SOP so what you need is like a letter of recommendation a statement of purpose and your GRE mm-hmm. <laughs> that's all that you need for an application yeah so I think I was little lazy in my fourth semester uh things were moving slowly but as soon as I came into my third year I started speaking with professors I want the letter of recommendation from I would highly recommend don't go for big names go for professors who know you okay. who can vouch for you mm-hmm. and who can say good things about you instead of writing a generic letter i mm-hmm. very strongly believe my let, believe my letters of recommendation were very personal very thorough and i know they were strong because i'm currently at princeton yeah <laughs> but i genuinely i i knew those professors i had worked very closely with them in a research mm-hmm. environment mm-hmm. so i would say get your letters of, at least warm up your professors about they will be giving you a letter of recommendation they'll they'll forget it by your uh, third year which is your final year but then they know in the back of their minds that they have to do it mm-hmm. then i started preparing for my gre lightly because i knew i had to get like a 330 score mm-hmm. in my gre i didn't do anything for tops okay yeah <laughs> um so i started preparing for my gre i started writing my statement of purpose because i Um, so you never go with your first SOP. Yeah, makes sense. I I changed it six times from scratch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Every okay. time I would write it, it didn't work out. Then come back after three days, rewrite it again. Six SOP, then you made minor modifications. So writing my SOP took me a significant amount of time and effort. Okay, so just uh, yeah, just okay. moving on with that, like with your SOP. Uh, so what do you feel like uh, from all these revisions? What do you feel like? are common mistakes that one makes uh, when yeah. writing their sop versus but you feel should definitely be uh, the structure or the flow of the sop so i feel an sop should be crisp very mm-hmm. crisp um you should talk about yourself but don't brag mm-hmm. anybody reading your sop is like 100x better than you in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. so don't brag be humble but also don't undermine yourself don't undersell yourself you're basically selling yourself and your sop is a reflection of who you are as a person Mm-hmm. So if you're inauthentic, if you follow a standard template, it will come across as standard template because not only you, ten other students will be following yeah. the same template. Mm-hmm. So the way I structured mine was, I was very clear in my first paragraph about what I'm applying to and what mm-hmm. do I want to do. My second paragraph was a little more elaboration of where exactly my research goals lie. Mm-hmm. So my first and first paragraph was like three sentences. I have mentioned that. I don't want to run in this, and my research interests are exactly like three words or what they are. Mm-hmm. Third, second was a little more elaborate. So third paragraph started. I started talking about like my research work, mm-hmm. my past work. How do I, how does it relate to where I want to go in life? Yeah. So that was like my third and fourth paragraph. My fifth paragraph was a little bit about me as a person. What do I like to do? How do I spend my time? Mm-hmm. Then I spoke about the professors I was looking at and why exactly I was looking at them. then a little bit about like why how i and university fit in together mm-hmm. so you know why you should take me how do i become a part of your community and what do i bring to the table mm-hmm. for the university in general and then i just concluded with please take me yeah <laughs> please don't use this words <laughs> <laughs> yeah <I> just, 
I'm joking. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, you you mean like the the entire flow should like feel as a good story behind like yes, how you evolve uh, and like how your research interest evolved over time to where you stand now at the time of applying. Yeah, yeah. I mean it reads as a story. The other person should be interested mm-hmm. because that's all that they say about you. Mm-hmm. You are the only time they see you as a person is through your SOP. So if I'm intrigued, if I'm interested, if I read through the whole thing, my chances of taking you are much higher than like I read a paragraph I'm already bored. Mm-hmm. It's a psychological thing. You will do the same if you were interviewing someone. So think mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. You also say that you like underwent multiple revisions of the draft. So uh, you feel yeah. that's an important thing. Right? Yeah. Um. Don't take it. Like, I ask my harshest critics <laughs> to read my statement of purpose. Always send it around to people. When you write yeah. an SOP, send it to your family, send it to your friends, make them mm-hmm. read it. And they'll usually be very brutally honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> Mine was sent back to me saying like, this is shit. <laughs> Yeah, you similar. Yeah. That? Like first couple of drafts of my SOP were like all red marks. Yeah, so that's very helpful. Uh, yes, and always come back to your SOP after like four or five days because when you write it, it feels great, and then you read after five days, you realize how bad it is. Mm-hmm. When you stop feeling that about your SOP, that's when you're you can send it out, and you can come back after a week and it still reads good to you. Okay, uh, you you spoke a bit about this about the recommendation letters. So, uh, how many letters of recommendations are required, say, for computer science? Uh, three. Three. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, say someone doesn't have three uh, professors who they work with from like a research point of view. So, uh, a professor three. you attended a class with, and you mm-hmm. were very good at the class. Okay, so that counts as well. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But as you said, the priority would be to take it from someone who knows you very well. Yes, because if you're applying for a research-based degree, then they want to know how good you are at research. What, what kind of a person are you in the lab? Mm-hmm. Right? Versus in a class setting. If you're going for master's, I think it's all right to uh, have a professor who you attended a class with. But at least keep like two research in one classroom is all right. I think. Okay. Uh, so how does the funding scenario work for PhDs in computer science in the US or say uh, other countries that you were aware of? So uh, fund, it's fully funded mm-hmm. um, and funding is generous because CS has money. Yeah. So you will be very generously funded from your first year onwards. Um, your tuition is taken care of, your stipend is taken care of. So you don't have to pay for living costs here, which is ridiculously high. Mm-hmm. If you try to start converting into INR. Yeah. But it's all, it's comfortable. Uh, mm-hmm. Also Princeton uh, does not, you don't have to pay for a master's in Princeton. Mm-hmm. They make you TA from your first year onwards, your tuition is taken care of and you get paid a stipend. Mm-hmm. So if you do a master at Princeton, um, you will be all right. Okay. Are you aware of like non-US uh, scenario? Not really. I think uh, I know about Cambridge. Um, and Cambridge, if you don't get, so basically we came in, at least for Cambridge, I know, uh, getting funding is very hard. Uh, some PhDs have to pay themselves. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So I guess the, the there the scholarship and funding is external that you have to apply for. The first yes, for Cambridge, I'm sure it's external and your professor has to apply for it. There is very little international funding mm-hmm. and there are very, a lot of international students. So some students sometimes have to fund themselves for a year. Okay. Yeah. I thought that was about master's. Okay, maybe it's also PhD. Even PhD is mm-hmm. ridiculous. So US is more comfortable that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a very popular question like personally i feel like gre is getting less and less important but still it's i think it's something that people want to know at least our post pandemic uh, gre is getting less and less important many universities have stopped having gre as a requirement also mm-hmm. which m- makes sense to me to some level but gre is a very good way to at least like because everybody comes from different universities so it's an equalizer um, to take in students if you ask me Mm-hmm. Uh, but for my GRE, I spent, I think, two months on GRE. I just had that uh, Manhattan five-pound book mm-hmm. and the standard GRE book that ETS gives you. Mm-hmm. And that was enough for my GRE preparation. Okay. So solve the five-pound cover to cover and you'll mm-hmm. be good to go because it has all the English questions that you require and all the math questions that you, if you want to do. <laughs> okay. And what about TOEFL? <laughs> don't take advice from me. I was reading the syllabus on my way to the exam. Okay. Yeah. I guess it's like, uh, if you prepare for GRE, then... You learn, and TOEFL is very basic English. Mm-hmm. And 
yeah of course if you if your gre exam i would say have give us gre before you give your doctor because then you're already prepared you're more than prepared for doctor Mm-hmm. And like when is a when is it a good time to give the GRE? Say for a three year BSc program. Yeah, so I did the wrong thing and came in October. Okay. It is too late, so I didn't have. I could, if my GRE went bad, I didn't have a second attempt. Mm-hmm. But I would say in the summer break do it so that you at least get up two attempts if your first attempt goes bad. Okay, so it's like a, the summer break after the end of your second year. Uh, so the summer break after the end of the second year, yes. Okay. Uh. Yeah, this is also something uh, which is very I don't know, uh, very popular, but also very uh, shady in the sense that uh, what qualities do you think that uh, top schools look for? Like many people are like I have poor grades or uh, but I, I, they might have good research or some people are like I don't have papers or don't don't have good research. Like which factors are important? Whether it's your grades versus SOP versus recommendation versus papers research. So. I am not an admissions counselor. So this yeah. is very third hand to fourth hand advice that I'm yeah. giving you. But I didn't have any papers when I applied. But I had very so. The thing is, people understand that every research work will not lead to a paper. Getting a paper is very hard. Mm-hmm. So you don't always require a paper. But if you can show that you worked on something original that you put your thought into, it didn't work out. It didn't work out, right? That mm-hmm. is life. Yeah. That's acceptable. I would say never run after easy papers. Mm-hmm. Run after more intriguing research. Papers will come, mm-hmm. and papers will go. Mm-hmm. But if you have strong research, if you worked on an interesting problem, you face the problem. You you face the full stop hurdle. Mm-hmm. It happens. Write it. Write about it in your SOP. But yeah. I reached to this place, and I couldn't yeah. go further. Yeah, I think they look for the process whether like you can yeah, handle the challenges. The process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, it's. About how you processed a problem and how you went ahead with it, that's what they want to say. And I think research is the most important thing. Uh, you can't have really shitty grades. <laughs> that just means poor time management. Yeah. Right. You need to have decent grades. So, in my opinion, GRE and GPA is basically to sort applications. Mm-hmm. It is a way that they can reject you, but it is not a way they will ever accept you. Mm-hmm. Nobody who's a ten pointer will get into a PhD program because of their grades mm-hmm. ever. So it acts as a threshold, kind of. Yes, I think that's how they sort applications when they start reading them. If you have a G- higher GRE and GPA, then you will get more points, and they will start reading yours quicker than the other one. So, if the sorts fill up before they reach your applications because you have lower GPA, then that's just that. Unless your research is so amazing <laughs> that yeah. they have to make space for you, which is. Which happens, but it's very hard and very uncommon. Mm-hmm. I would say maintain a GPA always. Get a three thirty GRE or at least around a three thirty, mm-hmm. and three thirty and above doesn't matter what it. So yeah. Aim for three thirty, and have like at least eight point five to nine GPA on a ten. Mm-hmm. That's my advice. And uh, what about the role of uh, say SOPs or NLOs? So that they are the most important. That's how you get in. Yeah. SOP or LO will decide who gets in and who doesn't. Yeah. But SOP, uh, please don't. When you write your SOP, don't talk about your childhood. Yeah. That's something I would genuinely press on. Don't yeah. talk about your school also. Mm-hmm. You only have to talk about what you did in your undergrad. If you are so uninteresting that you have to go back to your school to find things about yourself, they will see it. Mm-hmm. Talk about who you are as a person right now. What do you do right now? What are your interests right now? And what do you work on in your college? That's mm-hmm. all that they want in your SOP. And come across as a nice person, you would want to speak with if you read the SOP. Mm-hmm. Don't brag. I have mm-hmm. seen a lot of SOPs that are just bragging, and anybody reading your SOPs literally achieves so much in their life. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no point in doing yeah. it. LORs are extremely important because mm-hmm. you can say anything about you. What What is it that researchers you worked with talk about you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. An LOR. Can I think a strong LOR with a poor SOP can get you into a degree program, but a poor LOR with the best SOP possible, you will be face a rejection. Yeah, it's it, it's like a verification of what you said or claimed. And if both of them match, then you have an acceptance letter in your hand. Yeah. But okay, so and, it's basically a complex process. So. But an LOR is absolutely essential. Speak mm-hmm. with your LOR, the person giving you the LOR, very. Clearly and thoroughly about exactly what you expect from the LOR, and if they are ready to give you that mm-hmm. before both of you agree on the transaction of the LOR. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So did you interact with any professor or any faculty member regarding any of your application process or got feedback from them? Uh, be it your CV or SOP or so I any part? With, uh, I didn't speak with any professor mm -hmm. before I applied, which was not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I applied to Princeton. I got a reject from Princeton the first time I applied. Then I made the advice that I wanted to work with, asking, mm -hmm. why did I get a reject? And then David August, who is currently my advisor, very, very nicely told me exactly what all the, I was only, so I'm a CS, I, I, PSG right now, but I was a physics undergrad mm -hmm. and I didn't have any CS courses. Mm -hmm. So I lacked breadth. So David sent me links, literally links to uh, online courses okay. <laughs> where I can fill up this requirement because that's the only problem the admission committee had with my application. And I think they would help me a lot through this. Mm -hmm. uh, if I would have mailed him four months ahead, I wouldn't have faced a reject in the first place. Okay. So, so yeah. So you think it's an important thing to like I think uh, it's very email important. professor, like email not, professor. not regarding your application process, but at least like who you are applying to, like yes. email them Ask first. Ask them if they're taking someone and while mm -hmm. they're looking into the person that they're taking, what kind of a research do they do? Mm -hmm. And they will reply to you if they're taking somebody, they will definitely let you know what their expectations are, what does the group do, um, mm -hmm. how the group is. Mm -hmm. So do that. I would highly encourage. But don't send them your a mail with your CV attached to it saying, will I get in? Yeah. <laughs> they will blacklist you. <laughs> yeah. And don't pit advisors against each other. Don't ask them if I got into CMU and if I got into your program, um, how much better is yours? Okay. Because that's not the way. Yeah. Uh, also, one thing which is, would be like relevant, at least for your case, is that uh, people are scared to apply to a different department than what they did their undergrad in thinking that, you know, uh, the chances of acceptance would be lowered or, uh, or they might not, you know, be able to cope up in the grad school or something. So what would be your advice regarding that? You have to work a little harder if you change your stream. That's obvious mm -hmm. because yeah. somebody else has been through four years of that mm -hmm. and it's okay to work a little harder sometimes if you genuinely mm -hmm. love what you're doing mm -hmm. um the chances are lower because you don't have a degree in the field but if you really want to do it if you feel like you lack like experience get an internship if you feel like you lack like courses go to the online course work now you have like NPTEL, which offers free courses online in india Mm -hmm. And they also have a proctored exam and they give you grades which are accepted by university. Mm -hmm. So everything can be done. And there's solution to everything now. If you genuinely feel like you want to change your course, go ahead and do it. At least like you have, uh, the basics you require are maths <laughs> for literally any field you want to change. If you want to go from math to physics, physics to CS, the underlying concept is maths and computer science. You can learn more about CS as you keep coding more in your life. So it's, I think it's so totally acceptable and all right to change. Teams. I know an architect who's doing a CS PSP now, a principal, so like an actual architect. Okay, so uh, yeah, probably you have to like uh, show your interest and enthusiasm in your- uh, A lot of people here don't service. have a uh, CS bachelor's while mm -hmm. doing a PhD in CS. And I guess especially because a lot of these fields are so multidisciplinary that- uh, Yes. It, it's a common thing now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did you have interviews for any of your application process? No, no. <laughs> I was just selected. Okay. Uh, so how was your journey like post applying? Uh, so you first applied at the end of your third year of your BSc program. Uh, and you mentioned that you got rejected from that. And then you uh, emailed the professor regarding tips from that. So how was the journey like uh, after that? Oh, <laughs> take two. <laughs> Once I got rejected from Princeton, um, I did an internship for a year with a professor from ISC, uh, Professor Dipanjan Gop, mm -hmm. who runs a company called as Simeo. He is the CEO and founder of it. And it's a company started with his PhDs. Mm -hmm. So I did an internship with them. I was working. So they had this whole code of the, they had a simulator that they used to, an EMI, EMC simulator. And I basically took that entire code and made it like two times faster just by changing the way the code is written. Okay. So I made algorithm level changes mm -hmm. to it, understanding how the underlying architecture works. Mm -hmm. And I got really good results. So he gave me a, I think he gave me a strong letter of recommendation. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the side, I also took NPTEL courses. I took four of them. Uh, I took parallelism, OS, architecture, 
and data structures and algorithms. Mm -hmm. I took these four courses, did that, did very well in the courses. And then I told, I also, David had asked me to keep him updated throughout the year about my progress. Mm -hmm. So I kept David posted constantly. And then I got my accept. I applied again in December. Since GRD scores are five years long, it's all right. I had to redo my whole statement of purpose because my life had moved on yeah. from undergrad. Mm -hmm. And then I got into Princeton. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. Like uh, how you specifically planned and prepared for like a place. Yeah. So while preparing your applications, uh, did you come across any useful resources or links or could be books, URLs or anything which helped you? No, I do. <laughs> Right. So I didn't find any good useful resources. I mm -hmm. reached out to people on LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> I called like people who are like admitted in those programs. Yes, I reached out to graduate students and graduate students are generally very nice mm -hmm. because they've been through the same problem. So yeah. they're very welcoming of questions and um, very, very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I'd also advise that, like, I think don't don't hesitate to, like, email people about Reach any out. questions you have, yeah. Maximum, they'll say no. Oh, yeah. Or don't reply. <laughs> that's a, or not reply, that, but that's the worst that can happen. And the best yeah. is they will reach out to you and help you. They mm -hmm. have nothing to lose. Yeah. <laughs> Since you said no and there are no resources, I guess, yeah, watch this. <laughs> but uh -huh. this is very nice. And I think what Costum is doing is very helpful for everybody else who will be applying now. Okay, this is not going. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The entire journey of like uh, applying for grad schools and all, like uh, you can prepare, you have to prepare a lot for each uh, place and then the probability of probably getting in, even if you have a good application is quite low. So uh, it could be very stressful, uh, the waiting process as well as the after rejection. So how would you advise like one should handle that? It's very hard. I face a rejection. Mm -hmm. So I know what it feels like. And which was my first choice institute. Mm -hmm. This was where I wanted to be. And this is the, the device I'm working with. Now the person I wanted to work with. And it's it's very disheartening because you put in so many hours and you put in so much work mm -hmm. and you feel like you'll get in, but eventually you don't. But it's all right. It does not mean that you're not good enough or that you shouldn't apply it further or that you should give up your hope and do something else that you don't like. If you feel like you're very passionate about something mm -hmm. and if you feel like this is the only way that you want to go, don't change your path. Mm -hmm. Reach out to the person you wanted to work with who rejected you. Ask them why that happened. Mm -hmm. He or she um, will let you know what went wrong. Mm -hmm. Work on yourself. You can always make yourself better. Find an internship. Do some get some work experience and reapply yeah. and do it. Don't think that since you didn't get into tier one you, university this year, you will only apply for tier two. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so thanks a lot for your time. Uh, do you have any final advice for those who are listening to this? Yeah, don't undermine yourself when you apply to universities. You never know that you'll get in and you'll mm -hmm. surprise yourself. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Know. you.